two, three, four. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the Power of Music Thinking. My name is Christoph Zürn, and this is the podcast for people with a musical heart and a wicked job. We're looking for stories, insights, and tools from the big world of music to inspire leaders and followers to listen, tune, play, and perform in whatever field you're operating. Hello, everyone, and Happy New Year. May it be a year of change to freedom and peace, diversity and inclusiveness, and a year where we all learn new perspectives, skills and knowledge to make our planet a better place for everyone. Before we dive into the first episode of the year and hear more about the question, are you a polymath? I have still a few things to say. If you want to find us, you can do this on musicthinking.com. There are tons of information about using musical principles for leadership, business and society. And if you want to contribute, please buy the book, The Power of Music Thinking. It will open your mind with analogies from the big world of music that you can apply in your work. And if you can't support us in that way, please subscribe to the podcast. Give us a rating and comment on Apple, Spotify or wherever you listen to us now. So, in the Power of Music Thinking podcast, we have conversations with exciting people that are also musicians. They see analogies between music and the areas they are working. So, what they do is combine knowledge and skills from multiple fields to make significant contributions to various areas. In the Power of Music Thinking book, I call them the end musician. I talk about this especially in the backstage chapter where we dive into analogies to switch from one field to the other, like black is too white as off is too on, or conducting is too classical music as producing is too hip-hop. But there's another expression for this, polymath. Think about people like Leonardo da Vinci, Hildegard von Bingen, or any guest on this program. All of them are masters in different fields. So today, I speak with Barbara Kleb, a trained photographer, a doctor of medicine, a leadership coach for polymath and musician. We speak about her personal journey, how studying multiple approaches leads to open-mindedness and that every team or board should have at least one generalist to understand and connect different perspectives. And Barbara shares with us a tool she uses in her coaching practice, Ikigai. We also learn, for example, that most UX designers are polymath, which resonated with me a lot being in UX and service design positions in different companies. Okay, let's give it a go. Hello, Barbara. Welcome to The Power of Music Thinking. Hi, Christoph. What a pleasure to have this conversation with you. Thank you very much. And shall, sh uh, shall I say Grüezi? Grüezi miteinander? <laughs> <laughs> miteinander, I'm alone, but yes, you can say Grüezi. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, you're in Switzerland, and uh, I heard there's uh, already snow, so it feels much more more Christmas than than here. And let's start with the first question, or let's say the ritual question that I ask uh, every every guest: What was your first sonic experience, or album, or performance, live performance that had an impact on you? There were many things, but the ones that stung out was, for example, a record uh, from that my father had. Uh, it's called Night in Tunisia. It's a jazz record. And I was really immersed in the drums. And it was like I was living in a, I was creating a picture from this from this experience mm. and the other one was uh i was singing I, i knew a lot of mozart by heart so i sang with the queen of the night and i found her very 
very sweet because she laughed so much. I think she had an evil character, but I didn't <laughs> want to believe it because she had this laugh and I loved to to sing with it. And Queen of the Night, you mean Magic Flute, Zauberflöte, yes. Mozart. And um, Night, of Tun uh, Night in Tunisia is Dizzy, Dizzy Gillespie, right? Yes. So two different different uh, genres and two different times even. And the first most express uh, impressive uh, concert was the one of Queen because I I loved oh. them. And when was it? Oh, ask me something. I don't know. <laughs> That's a, doesn't matter. <laughs> I was a kid. But was it in the beginning of their career or was it when they're all? No, it was. Stadium? It was not at the end, but it was not at the beginning. Sounds sounds interesting, but but singing um, um, the Queen of the Night, so Königin der Nacht, <laughs> um, that's quite that's quite special, isn't it? So did did you sing live with the with the record, or how how how, how did this work? Yes, I, I sang with the record. I found it normal. We sang a lot as a family, and and I always invented a second voice. Wow. Uh, when we were singing, and I think that sparked my talent for improvisation and later songwriting. If if you know the the, the famous uh, König in der Nacht, uh, it's it's coloratur sopran, so meaning it's it's more sound than words, and a second voice to it. So that um, yeah, I, I would love to hear. <laughs> okay, not to this one. <laughs> to other to other pieces I make second voices. <laughs> All right, okay, okay. But now you put me on a challenge. I have to listen to it. <laughs> Look whether that would be possible. Right, and next time when you when you do this, um, you can you always can send a recording when you do the second voice to it. <laughs> I will send it to you if I do it. <laughs> Thank you very much. Barbara, tell us a little bit more about you, about yourself, that we know what you do and yeah, what you do for a living. So as you might have already heard, I love to do many things as uh, in music. Uh, the first profession I learned was photographer. Then I learned medicine. Uh, specialized in gynecology and obst obstetrics and I have studied a lot of things there from acupuncture to homeopathy and sex therapy and many things that I cannot even tell you all of them because when I've learned them it's, it's fine it's a talent and now I'm focusing on being a coach for polymaths which are people like me who have so many interests and talents and need to to get them together and have a very rich uh, experience. Nice. So I think the the polymath part. Let's do this maybe in in a few minutes. Um, but I would be interested. How, how do you come from a photographer and to 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 medical doctor? What's the story behind this? I was just when I was a photographer, I didn't think I was good enough at that time. Hmm. doing it so that it would just flow and be enough fun i think later i could have done it but i needed to to unblock some some things to have access to to whatever it takes to to be actually a, a great photographer some colleagues of me had that special thing and i think if you don't have it it's it's just you stress and stress and stress mm. Was it studio uh, photography or outside? Yeah, I I was uh, working with still life photographers because if you if you learn it as an apprenticeship, mm -hmm. you go to an advertisement photographer and then you learn everything how to make the light and make the arrangements and it was great fun. I would uh, not want to have missed it. It was really uh, something that I absolutely wanted to do and um, but I didn't think that I was so talented that I needed to be that. But photography in, in, in that sense is also a craft. So you, you, you said you did the whole apprenticeship. What is it, two years or three years? Uh, three years. Uh, I, I, could, I could shorten it to three years. Normally it's four. Oh, wow. And I assume it's not digital. It's the, the, the real cameras. Right? Yes, I was, I was in the dark chambers. <laughs> laying in the four or five inch plates of of uh, film into the because we had those big 
cameras that you they have a black I don't know how they, it's called like a, a part in between the front lens and the back mm -hmm. with with it's folded you know what how they they are called it's a mirror they, inside the camera right yeah there is a mirror but there's also this part between the front and the back with this black uh bulk it's called in german i don't know uh, what the word in english is but okay. they were very big and you can you can change the front and the and the back so you could the um change the the area of of focus could be oblique instead of normally straight in a normal picture oh wow oh, that's very versatile so you yes 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 um... Then people can also understand from why you why an apprenticeship lasts four years uh, compared to the camera that we buy today in the store or have in our pocket uh, in the form of a smartphone. Yes. <laughs> Just <laughs> make a click compared to a, to to a real craft. And w were there any inspirations of uh, photo wise? Um, um, inspirational photographers in that time that you thought that would be yeah let's say, some kind of uh, inspiration for you? No, I was actually inspired doing stuff myself, creating stuff myself. Mm. Uh, I created like little animals with a brush and stuff like this. And I took that to the photographers and then they liked that as well. Mm, interesting. Why I'm asking is also a little bit from um, the difference between a craft where, where you learn the instrument and on the other hand, you look at pictures, which everybody can either in a magazine or now, nowadays on the internet and where you sometimes don't even know the story behind it. And um, there's a very nice quote from uh, Robert Frank. You might know him, uh, the photographer. And he said, the eye should listen before it looks. And I found this very poetic. So instead of just always looking and trying to make a snapshot, it's more just try to to sense the the environment and then make that maybe even with closed eyes. But that's what, what I'm making out of it. And is this something that resonates with you? Good photography needs to needs inner stillness and focus because you even if you take your your photography just with, with your handy. Yeah. It needs an inner stillness and a connection because you cannot just look at the object. You have to look at the background and the, the relationship and and uh, what you take out of out of it and how is the light and everything and how will it be when it's when it's actually on the picture. Yeah, it's much I... easier now because you see it. But when I learned it, you didn't see what was on the picture. Yeah, I think that's so interesting. With let's say. Um, analog photography so you, you have the scene you know the story you try to sense the, the 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 scene you make that shoot and then it takes quite some time until you you get it out and and you see uh, if it worked yeah what we did was uh, we made polaroid shots to test uh -huh. Ah, right. So like a preview from oh, how, how it would look like or how it could look like. And yes. then make the real uh, picture. Can you take us a little bit on your journey from photography to, to being a medical doctor? I worked in many different hospitals. And right now I'm just working one day in a hospital and two days in a practical, uh, in a practice and two days at home for the coaching that I mentioned. Hmm. But but how was that 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 part? How does does this idea come up from making pictures, being working as a photographer, and starting to yeah to to change your mind into uh, into being a doctor? There's no there's no co correlation. I just do what I want. I'm the connection. <laughs> Yeah, is there a story or is there? No, I think that's how I was supported as a kid, that we should learn what we want. So when I I found oh photography, I'm not gonna make it there, uh, then and and I had some other input to to go to medicine, and then I I always thought I have to finish what I started. So for example, I have to take. I knew that I wanted to be a photographer before I finished school. 
So I, I told myself to, to finish school and then do photography and then finish photography and then start medicine. So that I had all that I started finished because I thought it takes me to a weird place if I start doing that. That would be de detrimental for my life. Wow. So after the four years photography, how many years did you study before you your doctor? Uh, you study six years and you do at least five years in the hospital before you have your title. Wow. And then you worked in hospitals how long? Uh, very long until now. Yeah. Uh, what's very long so that the that the listeners have an idea? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, many many years. Yeah. So and and when when you're in the hospital and and the the doctor comes in, so they don't know your story. So it's just about it's a, it's it's about them. It's not about the story that you've been uh, a photographer that you were, let's say, inspired by your parents to just do what you want and and develop what you uh, what you want. Then you're in a different in a different situation. Yeah, but it helps to be who I am, especially when when I see patients for consultation. Then sometimes this is a topic. I can help them in a much broader way than if I wouldn't have done all this. And how would how does it work? I know what to say. I know the right words. I know the right actions for for her. Or I'm. I can understand her better. Yeah, because you, you have empathy or you have experience in another field. Both. It's a good way to first be a photographer <laughs> and <laughs> and then to, be, to, 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 to be a doctor. Is this something that you would recommend to other people first to do something before you try to start being a doctor? Is this? I would never recommend anyone to be like me. I, re I recommend everyone to be themselves. And do what they what they what they sense they they want to do, and then do it and enjoy it. But when you work together with other people, did you sometimes feel that people that have an experience in other fields compared with people that might not have it? How how is the how do they work together? If I if I spot another polymath, I'm very delighted because it's something different. It's just. The connection is just different, and and it's there's just a bit better background, and we understand each other better. And it's also working a team, right? Or how, how can you imagine working as a doctor? Can you? Tell yes, yes, yes. It's, you you you're working as a team. You have your role in a team. I was a, a leading doctor. Now I went back a step uh, to being overarching because I have a time limit, and. And then you have your the ones in your degree, and you have the ones that you have to to supervise, the ones that started after the studies, that are learning to be specialized. And I love to to help them to become better doctors and better persons. Okay, and there's also because we're this is the power of music thinking podcast. So there's also a musical side, and not only the inspiration, uh, let's say the childhood inspiration or the first records. Um, mm -hmm. what's the, what's your link with music? As I said, I, I had this musical upbringing with my family. I think we bonded as a family over music. My father was a, he wasn't a professional singer. He was a teacher, but he did, he sang in church for money. Mm. Uh, we, yeah, he, he studied it for, for quite a long time and he recorded two CDs. And I also recorded two CDs. I just had this dream. So once I was bored as a doctor, because I would, I can do everything I can do. And then I thought either I'm getting frustrated or I'm doing something else. And then I did a music course with young girls where we, we had some theory lessons and amongst other songwriting. And then we could write a song and I wrote the song that everybody And I made everybody sing with me on the final concert. And it stuck in everybody's head. And it was so much fun to do that. And then 
I I made the connection to somebody who was afterwards my coach because I haven't studied music, so I was happy that she could um, play the piano. I have been uh, singing with a jazz, the best, I think she's the best uh, jazz singer in Zurich, or maybe there's one or two better ones, but she's also What's in- What's her name? Marianne Rassin. Marianne Rassin. Marianne Rassin. She's in Swedish Rassin. and she can actually, uh, she can just capture the whole room. So when she has a concert, the whole room is with her. She's she's fantastic. And she showed me, she taught me that. So. <laughs> and, um, and yes, I, I took this course and then I, I wrote my song. And then once I went to Cuba and I, found a guy who said he was a taxi driver and a salsa singer and he said I need to go to bring you to the airport a bit earlier because I need to go to the studio and then I, I the bell rang in my head and I said yeah <clears throat> uh, I just asked him everything I needed to know for a studio and I took his number and I started writing 10 songs and after I've written them I sent him an SMS. I want. I have a dream to make a CD, and then he said, "Yeah, let's organize that." That sounds very easy. Writing ten, ten yeah. songs. It sounds like it was in a day. Or <laughs> how, how did this work? It's and how did you write the songs? Um, do the do the words come first, or um, how, how does it work? Yes, I'm. I'm. The word words come first. I think. The first thing is to condensate the topic, either the emotion or something that disturbs me so that it like really pisses me off, for example. And then I have to just sit down and I can write down the lyrics, which is very easy because I have been writing poems as a, as a kid as well. And then afterwards I can just, I, I took my, my phone and I sang in it the melody and then I looked whether I liked it or the way, where I finished it and then I have an instrument that has chords on it so I put the chords on it and then I wrote down the chords like a jazz lead sheet and then I took it to my coach and she verified whether it's musically wrong or something like this uh, and made little corrections and made me less complicated in yeah I needed to I needed to comply a little bit to the normal structure so other people could follow my music. In the beginning, it was too crazy. And <laughs> then, yeah, I, I wrote my lead sheets like this. And then I took them to Cuba with a recording, a piano and singing, and then we recorded. And, and why Cuba? Because uh, the musicians are very skilled. They have eight years until they have the basic... Uh, the basic study finished, and then they have uh, three more years to make the, prof the concert diploma. And the music sounds like Cuban music, or uh, no? I have always in in I have two CDs. I, I did the first one I printed as a CD, and then CD came out of fashion, so the other one is just in my head a CD, but it's it's sixteen songs, and in each. A CD. One of the of the songs has a has a cha 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 or something Cuban because they said we have to put a Cuban stamp on your album, Barbara. <laughs> right. Otherwise, why would you go to Cuba to, to, <laughs> to record? <laughs> nice. So um, you mentioned in the beginning um, a word, polymath. Maybe that's something that not everybody knows. Um, can we do the switch to 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 the polymath? And um, I realized when when we did our pre-talk, um, it's not a word that I would that I use uh, daily, but I think I should uh, because in actually when 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 I have conversations on the power of music thinking, I always ask people or I always look for people that do something special, like a doctor or phot photographer, <laughs> and a musician, and. 
there 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 are many examples like uh, albert einstein that when when he was working on uh, something very complicated or that's what i assume then it um, there's the story that he he would come out of the room play one hour piano or the or the violin and would go back and yeah just go into another area and get the inspiration or bill clinton the president we we know that he's a saxophone player and there's a famous picture um where where he's playing saxophone for the russian president many years ago and that's also interesting like from wow how would this work together if biden and putin would meet and they would just make music so where i want to 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 uh, I want to segue in, in, into the into the polymath where um, you are working in one or two or more areas, and but that's your um, that's your profession or or that's what you that we're doing uh, what you're doing now. So please tell us a little bit more about it. Yeah, I was uh, <clears throat> starting to to be a coach. I mean, I started many years ago as a doctor. You have also some coaching work that you're doing and then I started to to name myself coach and I started to know to to look for who would I be delighted to to work for and then first I had some empaths but then I thought it has to be somebody like me and then I have been called polymath when I was singing for somebody who knew that I was also a doctor and a business consultant in PwC and <laughs> <laughs> and other things. And then uh, he said, oh, this is more than a hobby, this song. Uh, I think you're a polymath. And then I didn't know what he was, so I, I looked it up. So polymath comes from many learnings and it actually means that you've learned a lot. So the key, um, the key value uh, is curiosity. Hmm. So it's the key driver, I could say. So that's also us. that's also the story from photography to medicine to music. Yeah. So um, that, that that explains explains a uh, explains a lot. I did a little bit of research. There's there's a book, the Polymath, from Vakas Ahmed. He's talking about the study that uh, a study with children. Uh, before doing an IQ test, um, they had drum lessons, and the and the kids that did the drum lessons scored higher on the IQ test than the kids that didn't have a drum lesson. So to to also make the the case for um, yeah that, that that it helps if we understand different areas that this will that that this will will be better. Is this something that you're also working on when you when you're in 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 your coaching practice? Yeah, I think those people are mostly really brilliant because they've done so many things. So you don't, but but in in what way are you coaching uh, the, uh, them? You don't make them the polymath. They all they are already they already are yes. Do they, do they know this word or they just say, oh, I'm a generalist, um, I work in different fields or how, how does this, how do they come? Yeah, they know it because uh, because I've met them on LinkedIn and then uh, we had a conversation mostly and then they're on my email list and then they get to know it and they see my posts, so they know it. And what do you post? Anything about how a polymath is that I take from myself, from people I observe, and then I mix it together. And it's a creative way of writing about polymaths in to, to, that they find a resonance with. So I can imagine if people listen now to us, um, that they think, oh, polymath, oh, that's interesting. I'm also doing different things. So when would you call people, or, or yeah, when would you call them generalist or, or polymath if they if they have been really dedicated to to several topics and not just have one thing as a profession and 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 another as a as a hobby and then they have uh, what i found out by working with them they have a different way of thinking 
polymaths can take different perspectives and they can hold them in their head at the same time. Hmm. And they're interested in synthesis as well as analysis. So they don't just go down the rabbit hole immediately. And sometimes they do, but often they just also take what they know from their other different fields and they're making connections. And so they can know stuff that nobody else knows because they have combined different fields. And what's the part of the of your coaching? The part of my coaching is whatever somebody wants. I mean, if somebody wants really the, the coaching, which is focusing them on, on it's like a, f focusing their thinking and making their thinking more speeding up their potential like their thinking uh, I can do that and sometimes there's some trauma stuff that they have to overcome to to be happy uh, and yeah I, I there's there's different topics burnout I have had and and building the the inside connection and Uh, focusing, not not losing the focus, and finding uh, finding what's really where to focus on because there are so many interests, and also overcoming shame. Oh, shame! Interesting. Mm -hmm. Why shame? A lot of people have shame, even if they don't know it. Maybe they're avoiding shame. Okay. Can you tell us more without getting into details of the two person <laughs> two personally? But that's interesting. And um, and I'm also triggered a little bit by um it sounds like a polymath, um, let's say the 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 universal genius, so like Da Vinci or Hildegard von Bingen or different different uh, ways where I think, oh, that's very really cool. But it, it sounds, or, or at least that's what I hear, what you say is that they will sometimes need the focus and not just be a polymath and, and knowing everything and seeing all connections. Is, is this something? And, 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 and where does the shame come in? This is... I think the shame is more a human emotion, but polymaths are, of course, human. A lot of, uh, okay, no, I shouldn't go that route because <laughs> we're on the shame. Uh, I think people of shame, they cannot use their whole potential. They do stuff like, uh, a lot of people are avoiding shame, like they're overachieving or they're, hiding themselves or they're be too friendly or stuff like this. And and then when they overcome this shame, they can go to their free, authentic self and and fulfill their potential much better. And it has a deep impact. Well, how long does it take? Or is there yeah, is there A journey is there a roadmap from uh, understanding and, and 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 getting in contact with you until that they have the idea from oh wow now now I see it or now I sense it or now I know or maybe they knew it before but they don't know how to how to do the focus. Um, I would say it makes sense to 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 work together at least three months. I'm very fast in what I'm doing, and. But uh, I've done stuff, free stuff for for just once, and then people were developing in a in a in a not nice direction. So I I want to collaborate more than just a one off session. That wouldn't mm. be good. Yeah. So there are no tricks like, oh, you should do this, and thank you very much. <laughs> yeah. It doesn't. It does need deep understanding. To, to do that. Can you share with us something that you could do or that, that would help um, a polymath to focus more? Maybe yes. that, that people that listening to us now yeah, could benefit from? Yes, what I'm sometimes using 
when people went to sh want to show uh, uh, to to find their area of focus is I use the Ikigai, which is a Venn diagram with four circles uh, that you can find in the internet, and then just. Uh, Ikigai is these, these four questions like yes, are things you, you good love, at... things the world uh, needs, um, uh, what is it, people pay for, and you're good at. So okay. we have those four questions, and then how I broke it down for a, for a webinar lately, which was people were kind of delighted because they've never broken it down for themselves, and then it doesn't work. Uh, I made a little symbol for everything, like a heart for love and uh, kind of a pile of money for money. Mm -hmm. And so, and then you can just take five minutes, focus on on all the stuff you like to do or you would like to develop. And then after after that, you take the time to add the symbol, all the four symbols. And then you see the objects that have all the four symbols they are then the stuff that are your ikigai, which is moving your heart or your life or what or however you see that. Would this mean that people are good at something, but they can't get money for it, for example? Yes, the breadless artist. Yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> and how does this connect with a polymath? For a polymath, I would say, well, come on, um, you, you're you're good in so many fields. And you 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 can you have the knowledge and the skill and in in multiple areas. And if you just combine this, that's that's the gold. Yeah, but maybe they a lot of polymaths are really enthusiastic in in making the world a better place, but that doesn't give them payday. And without payday, they don't have the money to survive to make the world a better place. So it's actually important to to combine those four areas. And that's a good point because um, when I let's say go on, on LinkedIn and see for look for new jobs, um, I never see a job like oh we re we need a generalist <laughs> or a polymath, some someone that knows or has experience in different fields and at least in at least in three and, and and we would love to have them in seven fields. What I see is just an expert, an expert with a track record of many many years and also with the foresight. Uh, for the next maybe five years. So that's what I mostly read. Yeah, and this is really frustrating for polymaths. That's that's important. But there are areas where they need polymaths. For example, in UX design, where you need to uh, user, ex uh, user experience design, where you need to have the user's focus as well as the focus of a, of a computer program and to adapt it so that it makes sense for a user to use a computer program better. There are many polymaths there. And the whole the whole UX or user experience also goes into customer experience or employee experience. So where people are involved, where people have to do something, it helps to 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 see their journey or yeah, their journey from different perspectives. So that that we yeah, that we feel the human um, in their whole, in their holy uh, um, thing, what what what, uh, what humans are. And I would encourage every business to have at least one polymath at their board because business is organized in silos, and people cannot uh, communicate with each other between the silos and also between the levels of hierarchy, and. Um, the polymath is the one who can actually connect it all together and find the truth and find where are the black holes in, in a business and stuff. Uh, would this mean the polymath would be the CEO or does that? That would be, uh, if the CEO is a polymath, that would be great. Then he already has his role, but he could also be an advisor in a board. Uh, he could be an architect or something like this, but he should be connected to the to the C-suite. Hmm. So actually, the the people that we would address, I'm I'm just thinking out loud, would be people from HR to to help others 
especially the business, to understand when there's a, a polymath or someone that that has um, extraordinary knowledge and skills from different uh, areas or fields, and that they try to encourage them also to to join the team. And which is sometimes I can imagine a little bit different because when we're talking about KPIs, key performance indicators, so how can you perform as a polymath or as a generalist when everything is organized in silos? How can the silos be organized and actually make the business profitable without having many suboptimal solutions that are lost in the in the space because just one silo doesn't talk to the other silo? I think consultants might be polymaths in if they're really not just looking for their consultancy to bring on in more consultants, but actually to help the business. Right. <laughs> yeah. Nice. Very, yeah. For, for for me, it's 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 very open because the what I call the the framework or the music thinking framework actually is um, the base is the connection, and and that's why I stress so much in music thinking that yeah, I would say I just hire a music thinker or someone who's doing music and other things um, because they will always understand that it needs more than just one dimension to make uh, some something great. Maybe um, a last question from my side. Um, when we talk about polymath um, or, or let's say these uh, universal geniuses, most of them are men. And I just assume that maybe women are much better polymath because they're already trained, um, especially when they are connected with kids and in, in, in the family. But from your practice, um, is this our poly? Yeah, what's what's your take about this? I mean, I think it's equal, or I don't know. I don't think there's a gender preference in my in my group that I've assembled so far. There are more men, but that's a, that's a, that's a historical how I built it in my profile uh, with whom I connected and stuff like this. So um, that's because of of that. Uh, but I I love women as well. But I was wanted to focus a little bit on men because I'm already a gynecologist. And I wanted to to take another perspective and and know the other gender as well, so that I'm not spending my whole life just focusing on women. Yeah, and maybe nowadays we only don't think in women or men, but all, in, in all the variations. Yes, <laughs> and maybe that's also a very good uh, uh, opening to not think in this dichotomy or this one or the other, but just um, trying to understand that 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 person. And uh, and if this person is connected with a lot of things, but um, I just bring it up because when 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 I thought about do I know polymath, I only can the, the only women that that I could came up with uh, is Hildegard von Bingen, uh, where we know that she was let's say an universal genius, and all the others are men. So and I thought maybe this is more, maybe a, a man perspective, and there mm. are many more women. There are interesting women, Hedy Lamar. She was the most beautiful woman in the world. And she just have, has this polymathic thinking and she was an inventor. She invented the, the base of what we have now, Wi-Fi and everything, because she wanted to help the army to, to, to win against the Nazi Germany. Um, who else? Um, yeah, there are, there are loads of women. I, I'm sometimes bad remembering names but but, but just leave, leave it like this so just make it very open so if you're um uh yeah if, if you're co if you're combining different areas and um and maybe just uh, think about about polymath so um yeah it's uh, yeah doesn't matter in in what uh, what direction you're you're heading so Barbara, thank you very much for for sharing your uh, all all your insights. Is there something that you would like to add that we didn't touch? Yeah, I think polymaths, if they're balanced and don't have psychological damage or something like this, they're very happy persons. 
and they have a a, a, a great radiance and and can inspire other people. So, Barbara, thank you very much. Thank and you as well, Christoph. Yeah. Thanks for 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 all your insight. Thank you. Thank you so much for listening. I really appreciate this because listening is one of the top leadership skills and I feel honored about this. It is my mission to find, create and share inspirations for meaningful collaboration based on music analogies. If you want to support this, please subscribe to the podcast, give us a rating or write a review on iTunes or Spotify. And more inspirations can be found on musicthinking.com. We have a blog and you can download the Music Thinking Framework. And finally, I would love to hear your feedback. And if you need help with a business challenge, please reach out to me via email podcast at musicthinking.com.